Are you familiar with the screw tape letters? I read those when I was in high school. C.S. Lewis wrote those, and the, the idea behind them is there is this big demon named screw tape, and he's got a nephew named Wormwood. And Wormwood is just out there as a novice demon, and he's got this fella that he's in charge of trying to deceive and ruin the life of. And so his uncle Screwtape, the experienced demon, writes him a succession of letters to help coach him on how to beguile, how to frustrate, how to lead astray his patient, the Christian. And it's got some really interesting concepts of how Satan tries to get at us. And I thought I'd start this morning with a couple of quotations out of the screw tape letters. The demon, the screw tape, tells his novice demon nephew, one of our great allies at present is the church itself. Because the church, when it's not the witness for Christ it should be, not only fails to shine the love of God into the world, but actually can turn people away from God. The church, when you can't trust uh, people in the church, it causes people to say, a bunch of hypocrites, I'm not going there. The church is something that needs to be carefully experienced. And it's not full of perfect people, it's full of imperfect people. But it needs to reflect the love of God. Next quotation. You must bring him, your Christian, to a condition in which he can practice self-examination without discovering any of those facts about himself which are perfectly clear to anyone who's ever lived in the same house with him or worked in the same office. Get him to deceive himself on who he is and what he does. Get him to be thinking, I don't have a problem with this, when it's obvious to everyone that he does. Letter 4 talks about sincere prayer. And in letter 4, this experienced senior demon says, it's funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their mind. When in reality, our best work is done by keeping things out of their mind. Not letting them think about the things they should be praying about. Don't let that come to mind. If you start thinking about too much of this stuff, you might start praying about it. So the demon says, that's what we want. Now, lesson six, letter six, is on focus. And he says, God wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. God may want you to do A. But the demon's goal is to make you think not, oh, God wants me to do A, but instead to think, if I do A, B might happen. That would not be good. And then the last thing that I'll illustrate for a point here is the letter on troughs and peaks, those high points in life and those low despairing moments. And the senior demon says, our cause is never more in danger than when a human asks, why has he been forsaken and still obeys? See, all of us go through those valleys of life. And in those valleys of life, if we sit there and say, well, why have you forsaken me, God? And then we just go off and binge on whatever it is that satisfies us. There's a difference between that response to the problems in life and the response that says, 
I don't see God right now. I don't feel God. I'm not experiencing God's highs right now. I'm in despair. I feel defeated, but I will still obey my Lord. And that's a very big step of faith. Now, I start the lesson with this because we're in a section of Revelation that is giving insight into the spiritual battle that all of us face. And so we've looked at this in a sense in three parts. The dragon, the beast, and as I said last week, other things, but this week we'll be more specific and call it the future. And I want to do this with three big points today. The first thing I'd like to do is cover the reality of Satan's assaults. The second thing is place this reality of Satan's assault into the larger context of Revelation, the book of Revelation. And then third, give you some points for home. Now, if we're looking at the scripture, the reality of Satan's assault is found in Revelation chapters 12 through 14. And I want to start by asking you a question. Are you ready? Can you spot, can you spot the famous fairy tale princess? If you can, raise your hand. All right, how many of you can also spot a famous literary figure? Yeah. Sherlock Holmes is right there, isn't he? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. There he is. You know, sometimes what we see is not always all there is. And here's the reason why. Satan may not be obvious in our life or in this world, but he is no less real. Some of his best trickery is done by hiding himself. Some of his best assaults are done when we don't really think about him, when we don't recognize him. Now, sometimes Satan attacks us with an obvious frontal attack. But there are other times where his attack is very subtle and he's hardly seen behind it. You don't really see the one pulling the strings behind what's going on. We know this biblically. Adam and Eve was a frontal assault. He just went right at him. But think about Moses and the Ten Commandments and the Golden Idol. Moses has been God's tool to call Israel out of Pharaoh's bondage in Egypt. They get to, they, they're, not, they're not big worshipers of Jehovah God. They've been there for hundreds of years. They've seen all the Egyptian idolatry going on. We don't know what they may have worshipped or what they didn't. But we do know that Moses, when confronted with God in the burning bush, says, well, they're going to want to know your name. Because all the Egyptian gods had names. What's your name? And God tells him his name. And it's a name, but it's not a frog. The Egyptians worshipped frogs. It's not a Nile. The Nile, they worshipped the Nile. They worshipped uh, uh, the sun, the sky, the mountains, the land. They they worshipped lots of things. And God's a concept in a word that means I am. God is the present tense. He's right there. And so Israel follows Moses and they get out and they get through the Red Sea and Moses goes up on the mountain and he's going to get the law and he's been up there a long time and the people are thinking, well, we know we need to be worshiping. We don't know who. We don't know what. So while Moses is up there getting a commandment from God that says, don't make any idols, the people are down there at the foot of the mountain saying, well, hey, if we got to worship God, we don't really know who this fellow is, but let's make up an idol and we'll just worship that. Thinking in some of their minds like they, well, we'll just uh, come up with a way to do it. 
That was a subtle deception and a subtle work, but it was uh, a dangerous one. Now, we are part of an ongoing war, and Revelation has made that clear. This is not a new thing where Satan comes after us. This is what he's been doing. So as part of this ongoing war, sorry, we we're having microphone issues. As part of this ongoing war, we read in Revelation that the dragon, which is Satan, has been trying to destroy Christ and his people. And that's been going on during the age of the church, even the age of what we might call a pre-church with Israel. But the dragon trying to destroy Christ and his people is going all the way to the second coming. That's what he's about. And that's why Revelation 12 sets this up by saying, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of the heaven and cast them to earth. Those stars being angels. And so Satan tries to devour the Christ child. He tries to stop the Christ child from coming into being. He tries to ruin the lives of the descendants of the Christ child, the church. And he calls forth two beasts. They're different beasts. The first beast he calls forth is the beast from the sea. And the second beast is the beast from the land. Now the beast from the sea... We talked about last week, that's the hand of Satan. That's his, his uh, working army, his working force in some ways. But the beast from the land is a little different. That's Satan's mind. Satan's hand is that full frontal assault of the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, at the time that this letter is being written... The Roman Empire was in war against Christianity and it was doing so as the hand of Satan. And, and, and I think the point is there for all of us for all time. Any entity that trumpets any Lord God other than the Lord God Almighty is in the hand of the enemy. Revelation 12, 15 describes this work of the beast of the sea, saying the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, the, the, the offspring of the, the God's people. Read that as God's people. A after the God's people, to sweep her away with a flood. And, and this is what was happening. And, and, and Satan brings every kind of delusion Every kind of onslaught, every kind of persecution, trying to sweep away God's people. And several verses later it says, the dragon becomes furious with God's people and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That is who the woman is. That's who God's people are. Now, if we go back historically and we put ourselves right smack dab in the center of when this revelation is being written, we can read from Cornelius Tacitus. He is accorded as one of the greatest Roman historians of all time. But he was a contemporary of John. And as a contemporary of John, at this time in history that the revelation is being given, Cornelius Tacitus is writing about Nero's fall. Nero was the emperor of Rome at a time when a good bit of Rome burned down. There was a huge fire in Rome. And all of the people rumored that this fire was actually started by Nero because it just happened to gut the neighborhoods that Nero wanted for himself to build his new palace. And then from there it spread out and destroyed most of Rome. So Nero's trying to cover his tracks. And so he starts giving gifts to the people. He's trying to do anything to quell 
the discontent and riots. And Tacitus writes, now this is not the Bible. This is a historian, one of the best ones we've got. All human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor did not banish the sinister belief that the fire was the result of one of Nero's orders. So to get rid of this report that it was Nero's fault, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Nero blames the Christians, hated for their abominations. Do you know why? Other reports we have from ancient history, the early Christians at this time were cannibals because they ate the body and blood of this fellow named Jesus in their little secret church meetings. And the Romans and the rumors were that the Lord's Supper was actually acts of cannibalism by people who just knew no better. But hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, which is the Latin form of Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, capital punishment, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Jesus Christ is not a historical person. He continued, mockery of every sort was added to the deaths of the Christians that were blamed for the burning in Rome. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burned to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle. He would hang them up, set them afire, and let them burn as a torch in his garden. This is what's going on while John's writing the Revelation. Satan had a full frontal assault from the Roman Empire on God's kingdom, on God's people, on, on uh, uh, the woman. But that's the full frontal assault. That's the beast from the sea. Look at the beast from the land today. Satan's mind. And it's, it's really interesting. This is the more subtle assault. So this starts in chapter 13 with verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. Now it's rising out of the earth because this is a reflection of earthly wisdom, of earthly philosophies. Be thinking of things like James. In James chapter 3, verse 15, we read about wisdom and the difference between wisdom above and below. James says, Who's wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. This is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wisdom of the evil one, demonic wisdom, rises out of the earth. In Revelation 13, 11, just like James references evil, demonic wisdom coming from the earth. This is the world's philosophies. These are the people who try to convince you right's not right, wrong's not wrong. These are the philosophies that can try to convince you that wrong is right and right is wrong. They can seduce you into thinking God doesn't care about you. There isn't a God. This is the world's wisdom that tries to tell you science has answered all of our problems. 
This is the world's religion that tries to tell you it's just a question of whether or not you're being good enough. This is what is the deceptive, subtle ploy of the enemy. Look at him. Two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Looks like a lamb. But the words give away what it really is, and it ain't Mary's little lamb. The, by the way, that's not Mary's little lamb because that's actually a goat. I had trouble finding a little lamb with, <laughs> with, with two horns. But uh, Tim, Tim's going to get on me for not knowing the difference between a lamb and a goat if I don't point that out. Uh, this is much more what we read about in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. You remember that passage where Paul talks about Satan? It's a very important passage. Every young person needs to know this, but so does every old person. 11.14. Paul's writing about false apostles. And he says, these are deceitful workmen. They disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan himself, he, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Be very careful of people who tell you they're religious, who tell you they're Christians, when their works show they are not. Be very careful. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 7, 15. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. You don't get grapes from thorn bushes. So this is the beguiling of earthly wisdom in Revelation. It exercises all the authority of the first beast. It's got the authority to give you a full frontal assault. It makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Worship the forms that are against Christ. That set up other lords than Jesus. Whose mortal wound was healed. And it's again a reference there. Beware the allure of false philosophies and false religions. Because these are ones that can even perform great signs. Make fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. I think about um, when our son um, was at Oxford and I would go visit him. It would give me a chance to meet with a lot of different people at Oxford that were other students and other professors and and. I have always been amazed at how some people thinking that they are so smart are able to beguile people. It's as if we just will believe what they say because, well, they just seem smart. And I mean, after all, they're able to do all sorts of things that we can't that seem even miraculous. Be, be careful. Just be careful. Because the, the beast will perform great signs, making fire come down from heaven. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24, this is, all, this is a sign that, that what Satan's about. He's about trying to do his own little things to make your mind believe him. By this signs, it's allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on earth. That's what it's about. Deceiving us. Telling them, make an image for the beast. That was wounded by the sword and yet lived. In the immediate context, that's Roman Empire. But it's much broader than that. This is any institution, any philosophy, any idea that sets anyone on the throne other than Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ alone deserves our worship and adoration. Jesus Christ alone we live for. Jesus Christ alone is our motivation for what we do. Jesus Christ alone is our measuring stick for what's right or wrong. And I don't care what company you might work for. I don't care what school you might go to. I don't care what government you might live under. Anybody or anything that puts someone other than Jesus Christ on the throne is a beast. And any philosophy that tries to convince you that that beast belongs there and that anything else is worthy of your worship or mine is from the mouth of Satan and is the tool of Satan and should never be followed. The revelation continues to say it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast to make this worldly philosophy look so good so that it can even speak. So that it might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. This is what it's about. It is a road that leads to death. If you put anything on the throne other than Jesus. If you put yourself on the throne in front of Jesus. It causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. Um, marked. We're going to talk about this in a minute, but I want you to get uh, I want you to get this and notice a difference here, because Revelation's making a reference. Revelation thirteen sixteen. Those who follow this world are marked on the right hand or the forehead. John has already told us in the previous vignette, back in chapter 9, that the demons were not allowed to harm the grass of the earth or the green plant of any tree, but only those people who don't have the seal of God on their forehead. So we've got two groups of people here. Those that have the seal of God on their forehead and those that have the mark on their forehead or their right hand. Now, you can think a literal mark or a literal seal, but this is a book of symbols and imagery that is conveying a deeper message. Look, it, Tim can tell you, probably a bunch of you can, that you brand cattle so that people know it's yours. Back in the day of John and the Revelation, they not only branded cattle, they branded slaves. And it shows who you belong to, who you served. By the way, serve is another word for who you worshipped, who you ascribed worth to, who was it. And so the people who have the mark of the beast on their forehead or their right hand, these are the people who belong to, who serve, who worship this world and its systems, who worship something on the throne other than Jesus. We see this clearly if we just keep reading. Revelation 14, 9 makes it real clear. This is Revelation interprets Revelation, if you will, and lets us know this is what it's talking about. So we can go to Revelation 14, 9 and 14, 11. We haven't gotten to it yet, but another angel, a third, followed, saying, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, the word, whoops, the word and is also even. It's, a, it's explaining what it means there. If anyone worships the beast and its image, in other words, if they receive a mark on their forehead or their hand, if that's who they worship, if they have been branded, if they walk around as if that is what is worthy of worship, then heaven help them. Because the beast will cause everyone to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. Now the right hand is always, not always, but almost always in the Bible, a reference to where you're doing your work. 
Jesus sits down at the right hand of God. Jesus did the work of God. Your right hand was your working hand. So if they're marked by the way they work, or they're marked by the way they think and live, their forehead, by the beast. And you say, well, what does the mark look like? It's the fruit of your life. Who's on the throne is evident in what you do and evident in what you think. And that's why we're to bring all of our thoughts under submission to God. That's why we're to do everything we do, whether in word or deed, in the name of Jesus Christ. We must be putting God on the throne in the center of our life or we are living under the seduction of the beast, of the evil one, of Satan. And it's so bad in the world. And it certainly was in the time of Revelation in the immediate sense of the Roman Empire. No one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. You will... I was told when I started becoming a lawyer. And some people understood that I wasn't only a lawyer, but that I preached in, as well. And that my faith was real to me. They said, you better divide those two up. Don't bring that faith stuff into the legal world because the legal world is not a faith world it's a dog eat dog world sometimes you got to do things that are wrong sometimes you got to do things that are different priority if you're going to try and bring your Christianity into your workplace you never will succeed as a lawyer they're wrong by the grace of God I don't mean to say I've been perfect in all I've done, but I'm here to tell you that any success I've had in the practice of law is because God's been behind it, is because God's on the throne. And if we ever try to live in any way thinking that to survive in this world, well, it's fine to say that's, you know, that's good for Sunday morning, but not Monday when you get to work. Wrong. Jesus is on the throne 24-7 or he's not on the throne he doesn't step off the throne on Monday morning. You just might not choose to let him be on your throne Monday morning. But if you're not, you are doing your right hand and you are doing your forehead under the lordship of the beast. This calls for wisdom, John says. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number. Of the beast. You want his number? I'll give you his number because I got his number. The number is the number of a man. It's 666. 666. Now it doesn't say 666, it says 600, 6, T, tens, and 6. 666. That's his number, the number of a man. Now, people have gotten so wrapped up in this. You can take the letters in the name Nero, and you can get 666 out of them if you take each letter and assign it a value. And so a lot of people say that was Nero. You can also take... Vicarius Filii Die, the Vicar of Christ, which is not an official title of the Pope, but it's a familiar title of the Pope. And if you add the Latin of those characters together, you can get 666. So a lot of people think it was Nero. I've heard people think it's the Pope. By the way, I don't think it's the Pope. Uh, I don't want any of my Catholic friends or anybody else to, let me call the Pope the Antichrist. No, I'm saying that it's not. You can take, did you know in Hebrew, W is a six. The Vav is a six. Vav, Vav, Vav. The World Wide Web, literally in Hebrew, is a six, six, six. I knew that internet was up to no good. How about them barcodes? Have you looked at any of them that have 666? That's why Kellogg's Raisin Bran's not as good as Post Raisin Bran. It's got the beast on it. 
Did you know you can take the code that makes up the emoji of an OK sign and it adds up to 666? And there are some vaccines that do as well. No, 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 no. It's the number of a man. His number is 666. And the Greek, get Charles Mickey up here to read this Greek. Um, arithmos, that's his number. We get arithmetic from it. Arithmos, for it's the math, the number, anthropu of man. Doesn't have the word a. Greek didn't really have an A. It can be added or not, but I don't think it's very helpful here. It's the number of man. Six is the number of man. Don't ever start thinking you're a perfect seven. Genesis 127, do you know what day you were made on? Six. And we've talked over and over every class. You thought you were going to get in a class and I wouldn't use this slide. Every class about the peculiar use of numbers in apocalyptic literature like this. And that peculiar use of numbers where three is associations with spiritual and divine and four are associations of the physical world and, and seven where you add them together is perfection and completion. What is six? Six is the imperfect. It doesn't measure up to seven. Six is, look, God finished creation on day six, but he still had day seven to make it complete. In Daniel chapter three, the, the idol that's set up by, by the, the emperor is an idol that's all measured in sixes. This is the spiritual warfare that's going on with us. And the mark of the beast is one that looks like it could almost be perfect. Almost a seven. But it's a six. And any time we have anyone on the throne or anything on the throne other than Jesus Christ, we have imperfection. We have all of the evils and horrors and judgment that come with following this world's systems, which are just a puppet of the devil. Second point, and I'll be quick. Let's place this into the larger context of Revelation. Do you remember that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega? It's, it's a reference to God in the beginning, and it's a reference clearly to Jesus in 2213. In other words, that's, that's important here. Jesus is the beginning and the end, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And it's important to say that in Revelation because in Revelation, all of our visions and vignettes begin and end with Jesus. So we've got these series of vignettes that we've been looking about. Christ in the lampstand with the seven letters to the seven churches. Some of them are a frontal attack. Some of them are more subtle. You can look at of Ephesus losing its first love. Very subtle the way they fell for that trick of Satan. You can look at Sardis where they've fallen asleep and they're asleep at the wheel and they're not paying attention. Very subtle the way they've fallen for Satan's tricks. You can look at Thyatira who's been seduced by Jezebel and they're walking into sin. Very subtle. You can see some that are much more frontal attacks. Smyrna is in tribulation. They're suffering the tribulation. You want to know, hey, well, when's the tribulation coming? It's already here. It was there. Go back and listen again to what Tacitus was saying. Pergamum. Antipas is roasted and toasted in the belly of a, of a torture machine. Laodicea, who's been beguiled by their riches to think they're rich when they're impoverished in the spirit. Philadelphia and the synagogue of Satan where they're trying to live and work. All of this is, is Christ in this very vivid way trying to, to explain from Alpha to Omega 
what it is like in this spiritual warfare. If you look at the second section of Revelation, the heaven and the seven seals, you've got Jesus as the only one worthy to open those seals. Uniquely, Jesus is the only one who can open the will of God for humanity. Because God's will is for redemption. God's will is for him to make his home again with people. And that can only be done in Jesus Christ. You've got in that same thing a picture of martyrdom as people are dying because they hold to Jesus. But in the process, God takes 144,000 and he seals them. And he seals them on their forehead with the name of Jesus. Which means the work of Jesus. Means who he is. And we're sealed on our forehead. Not that you see it here. But our mind and everything we do is, is, is claimed by God. And we read to the end there that as a result we will find the day where there are no more tears. And that's that second vignette, Alpha to Omega. The third vignette, Alpha to Omega. Whoops, get the third one up there. Are the seven trumpets. And these are warnings that judgment is coming. And everything that's happening in this world today is a warning that judgment is coming. God allows tragedy to occur as a warning that judgment is coming. Bob Dylan sings, when are you going to wake up and strengthen the things that remain? Quoting Paul in Philippians. And then we're in the section we're in right now with the persecuting dragon. But all of these sections, all of these cover the age of the church to the second coming. Jesus from Alpha to Omega. And as we get to this last section in Revelation 14, it shows that the church will share the triumph of Jesus. The church shares the triumph of Jesus and it's divided into three parts. So I want to get through this quickly. But I want you to hear it. This may be the most important part of this message. The first part is the blessedness of the redeemed. Five verses. Let's cover them quickly. Then I looked. Kai, I don't. That is, each of these three paragraphs will start that way. So we know there are three sections. Behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. That's us. That's the redeemed. Name, Onoma, that's who he is, that's his character, but it's also his resume. It's what he's done. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's what guides the way we live. That's who we worship. That's who we're marked by. Then he continues that 144,000 with the Father's name written on their head. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of waters and the sound of loud thunder but also like a harpist playing. Strong, loud, firm, and yet gentle and beautiful and melodic. And they're singing a new song. Every day you let God work in your life. Every day you let Jesus sit on the throne. Every day you live your life subject to him. He will do things in your life that have never been done before. He'll bring you to a peace that you've never had before. He will give you a purpose you've never understood before. And he will infuse you with strength you've never experienced before. And that will enable you to sing a song that's never been sung before. Because it's the song of who you are today in Jesus Christ. And it's someone you've never been before. And every day we sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the redeemed. 144,000, that is that three and four. That is those perfect numbers of all things divine three times, instead of plus, all things earthly four. Twelve. Twelve times twelve times a thousand. That's the complete kingdom of God. These are the ones who've not defiled themselves with women. Don't say, oh, yeah. Well, also virgins. Women who haven't defiled themselves with men. What he's saying is people who have sought God purely and aren't living in adultery to God. 
It's those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And they've been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. God, they, they are the people of God. They are His. That's who we are. In their mouth, there's no lie. They're blameless. This is the blessedness of the redeemed, but it doesn't stop there. There are warnings that need to go out to humanity. Kai I don't. Again, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. Every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. And this word dwell, Cathay, um, Cathay Mai, uh, is, means to sit. Uh, these are people who, who are sitting. These are people who are just indifferent to God. They're not paying any mind. They're just indifferent. They, 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 they're just lazy. <laughs> and the angel is saying to everybody who's just sitting on the earth, of all people, he's saying, wake up. Fear God. Give him glory. The hour of his judgment has come. We have hit the second coming coming up here. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And then the other angel follows saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. So if those who sit on the earth are those indifferent, these are those who've been seduced by this world and its system. The great she who made the nations drink the wine of the passion of her immorality. And another angel, a third, if anyone worships the beast and its image receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, anybody who is putting anyone on the throne other than the Lord Jesus, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. They'll have no rest day or night. These worshipers are of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name, whoever lives in lordship, in service to Satan and his empire. So here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Here is a call for those who want to keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Those who have the mark of Jesus and serve him, have a different destiny than those who serve the evil of this world. And that should be a warning to humanity. Because there's going to be a harvest at the end of time. There's going to be a harvest. I looked, behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man. Here comes Jesus. He doesn't wear a crown of thorns anymore. <clears throat> now he's got a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel comes out of the temple calling out with a loud voice, saying to, to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. The harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Jesus will come and claim his own. He will harvest us. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time will be no more. And the morning dawn eternal bright and fair when the saints of earth will gather on the, over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Now, that's the first fruits. But there's a lot of fruit left. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. The first fruits are there. But just as the harvest at the end has the righteous gathered to Jesus the wicked are judged and another angel comes out of the temple in heaven and he too has a sharp sickle comes out from the altar the angel with authority over the fire says put your sickle in and gather the clusters from the vines of the earth it's grapes or wrath he swings across the earth he gathers the grape harvest of the earth he throws it into the great wine press of the wrath of God and it's trodden outside the city and the blood flowed as high as a horse's bridle for 16 Hundred stadia. That's the world four times the world four times a thousand. That's uh, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored. 
And so here are your points for home. First, notice something. God keeps all his people. God keeps all his people. He marked 144,000. And how many did he bring home? 144,000. Not 143,999. He's not missing one. All of his people he keeps. And all of his people get to sing a new song as God continues to work new and fresh in our life. We will be singing a new song before the throne because we've been marked and we've been sealed and we have the Father's name written on our foreheads. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we give you all glory and honor and praise as the victor, the champion. We confess we're not good at keeping you on the throne. We confess, we listen to the allure, to the siren's song of the wicked, evil one. But Lord, our heart's desire is that you would continue to, to work in us, to cultivate in us the fruit that reflects your love and your goodness, that we would care about you, that we would be more diligent at following you, that we would walk in your forgiveness for our sin, even as we try to focus on being better out of love for you and an understanding of the truth. We pray all these things in the name of the victorious one, Jesus. Amen.